Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Very excited to be talking about neuromodulation enhanced mindfulness. We have Dr. Jay Sanguinetti joining us on the show. Hello. Hi, great to be here. Thank you so much for yeah. coming on. Really Thank appreciate you. it. I'm super excited. Very grateful to the Awaken Future Summit that we were both just at as well. Such an awesome congregation of psychedelics, meditation, technology, and you were speaking there. Mm -hmm. which was awesome. And now we have you on the show. Really excited. Jay's background. He is a research scientist at the University of Arizona focused on how neuromodulation can augment cognition and mindfulness using transcranial magnetic, electrical, ultrasound, and near-infrared light stimulation. He's also the assistant director for the Center for Consciousness Studies, which runs the largest conference on the study of consciousness. And you can find the links in the bio below to his website, jsanguinetti.com, as well as the Twitter. So, Let's jump into things with one of our favorite questions to ask, Jay. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? <laughs> Start with the big question. Huh? Uh, well, you know, I think that it is one of the most interesting times to be alive as a human, uh, which is a big statement, I know, and probably any time that you're alive as a human feels like the most interesting time. Um, but there are these two extremes that are facing us, and one of them is... Uh, economic and environmental change on a scale that I don't think humans have lived through before. Uh, we are growing together as a species. There's almost 8 billion people on the planet, and our economies are intermixing in this global economy, which is leading to all kinds of interesting disruption, uh, you know, flow of goods and things like that. And at the same time, we have this environmental crisis um, and I think that there's enough data there now to start becoming fearful, to start worrying about the future over the next couple hundred years. And so on one end, there's a lot of reason to be scared about what it looks like to be a human over the next 50, 100, 150 years. On the other end, we have all this amazing technology and technological advancement, uh, both on the end of having magical little boxes in our pocket that have all the information humanity seems to have ever created, uh, right there at your fingertips, to the advances in medicine um, broadly that are going to drastically extend human life. Um, so I think we're, we're nestled between these two interesting situations, where on one end we have a crisis that is solvable and we still have time to solve it, and on the other end, if we can make it past some of these significant thresholds and just hold on to the environment long enough, uh, we're going to see a future unlike anything that was ever written in the great sci-fi books in the 1950s. I mean, we're going to see a future we can't even imagine. And so it's super exciting if we, need to, if we can just activate ourselves to solve some of these crises that are facing us, especially the environmental crisis. Uh, we're going to get to a future that's going to be amazing to live in. And so I'm optimistic about it. Um, I think that human nature is to be curious and to solve hard problems. We've done that all through our history. And so I think if we can get together collectively and get over uh, you know, our individual needs and work as a group, a uh, global group, then I think we're going to solve these problems. And our children's children are going to see a future that we wouldn't even recognize. So. Excellent synthesis. Yeah, yeah. That, was a good, that was a great one. Thank you. All right, let's go into the journey now. So Natch, Natchez, Mississippi. Natchez. Yeah. Natchez, Mississippi is the birthplace. Yeah. And then how did you get hooked into science, neuroscience, when you were younger, and then teach us about the transition all the way to the University of Arizona? Um, it's a good question. In, I really wasn't that much of an academic kid. Uh, I struggled all the way up to high school, uh, really. I think I was sort of bored in school. Um, and so I was always interested in things like astronomy. Um, in the South, we have the uh, NASA camp in, in Alabama. You know, I did things like that that sort of got me interested in science. But as a kid, I always thought I was going to be a professional soccer player or a basketball player, maybe a race car driver. You know, I had aspirations that had nothing to do with science. And I think I probably thought that was kind of geeky um, growing up. Um, uh, somewhere around my junior year of high school, I realized that I wasn't going to get into college with my grades that I had. And so that kicked my butt into high gear. I started taking what are called AP classes, advanced placement classes in North Carolina. 
and um, it was actually in a class on psychology and, and neuroscience um, that really sort of woke me up, woke up my sort of intellectual curiosity side. And, um, it was that I think was always there, you know, as a kid. It just, I never had the right environment to really bring it out. Um, and it was in AP Psychology, actually the professor, or the, the teacher at the time, who's now a professor, said something uh, that really challenged me as a kid. He said, everyone in this room is going to become like their parents. And he said, this class, by the end of this class, you'll know why I'm saying that. And I was like, no way, you know, as a <laughs> teen, you know, 16 year old teenager, I'm not going to become like my parents. Um, but by the end, we had learned about genetics, brain science, the, the role of environment on all of those things. And by the end, I wrote a term paper on it, and I said, yeah, I'm probably going to be like my parents. That's okay, you know, now I think that's okay. And so really through that, it just activated me, and that's really what I wanted to do from that point on. Yeah, whoa, oh, cool. I, I love shifting moments like that. Yeah. That's great. And then how did from there then you go, okay, University of Arizona is where I want to go and do this PhD. How did that transition happen? Um, it, I got two undergrad degrees. One was in philosophy, and it was really focused on philosophy of science and sort of consciousness studies generally defined. Uh, I learned pretty quickly that there was a whole other side to that question, which is what's the brain have to do with that? And so I got a degree in psychology and neuroscience. Um, we had a psychology program, and I worked in a neuroscience lab. And I really got to see that question from both dimensions. What, is, what are the cells and the networks of cells? have to do with creating consciousness and what are the questions around that? And then what are the philosophical rational traditions um, around consciousness, what we know about consciousness, you know, things like cogito ergo sum, you know, cogito ergo sum, things like Descartes said, you know, I, so I kind of learned about the historical tradition, um, which really framed the way that I think about how the brain is involved in consciousness, how consciousness evolves from the brain and things like that. So I applied to several uh, universities for graduate school. I didn't think I was going to get into any of them, so I applied to like 15 schools. Um, and the U of A, University of Arizona, was the one that really had both a, a strong philosophy program and a strong neuroscience program and a strong psychology program. Sweet. And so I ended up getting into a few of the schools and chose the University of Arizona specifically because it was right at the center of all these interests that I had. Um, I had also seen a movie called What the Bleep Do We Know? Mm -hmm. um, some of your viewers out there might know that movie. Um, at that point, I, I really liked the movie. Now I think it's portraying quantum physics and consciousness in a totally uh, wrong and, and incorrect way. But there was a guy in that movie, Stuart Hameroff, that I sort of gravitated to, you know, even in undergrad. And he was at the University of Arizona. He runs the Center for Consciousness Studies, which now I'm assistant director to. And so I think on some subconscious level, I had this wish to kind of work with him. Uh, I never actually thought it would happen, but I think uncon you know, there's all this unconscious stuff that drives your behavior, actually. And I think that was one of the things that kind of drove me there. Um, I ended up meeting Stuart about three years into graduate school, and now I work with him, and he's a good friend. So it kind of worked out. But. And what an ex awesome intersection, philosophy, psychology, neuroscience. Yep. I think therefore I am. There's so much to end up still in the next century. This seems like it's going to be that century of neuroscience, understanding consciousness. It's going to be very exciting along yep. with lots of other subjects. But let's do the, okay, cognition and neural systems. This is what was the focus um, up until 2014. Mm -hmm. And you were, give us, give us the thesis on the visual, on the visual system. Mm -hmm. that you were understanding and working with? Sure. So my PhD was in a program called Cognition and Neural Systems. And the idea was really to look at cognition, which means memory, perception, emotion. These are cognitive constructs that actually come from Aristotle's philosophy. He had on his library just broken consciousness into these concepts. And so today we think that they have a real place in the brain somewhere and we're sort of looking for them. But they're good organizing constructs for looking at brain function. And so we start with a question like, what is perception? How does perception work? What are the organizing principles for the perceptual system and you know, how the brain takes all this information from the retina and figures out what's out there? It's actually a really, really difficult question. And when you try to teach a robot how to do that, which is happening right now all over the country, 
all over the world. Um, it's very hard, actually, to teach a robot how to parse the visual scene. And so we start with that question, and then we ask, how, what does the brain have to do with that question? How is the brain systems and the neural systems underneath sort of extracting information in a way that's relevant for building perception on top? And so it's the intersection of psychology and neuroscience is a short way to say that. So when I entered school, uh, I really wanted to study consciousness. That was the question. How, what is consciousness? How does it emerge from the brain? Um, or is it, is it everywhere? You know, mm -hmm. can, we, can we even answer that question? Um, when I pitched this uh, early on in graduate school, the answer was, you'll never get a job asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> Most people in the neurosciences are going to think you're crazy, and you should probably not use that word when you're at certain conferences. Um, and so the idea was to study something tractable, meaning is there a question that we can actually s get answers to? Um, the, the question of consciousness, we may never actually have an answer because we're too stupid to figure it out, for example. So pick a question that we can actually study and define, and me, as a, a small, limited individual human scientist, you know, a question that I can advance the field very incrementally. And so the question became, um, how does memory influence what we see? Mm. Um, and that's a, a sort of fundamental question about how perception works. Because um, leading up to about the 1980s, the idea was that the visual system completely takes the visual scene apart. So for example, if I show you an object here, it has a definable line, but this is actually a very hard problem for a robot. A robot would have a hard time telling you that this is a cup because it's clear the edges are hard to see and mm -hmm. it won't be able to define them. Mm -hmm. But you look at it and you see there's an edge and there's mm -hmm. an edge. Mm -hmm. And so somewhere in the visual system, there's a little bit of a neuron, there's a little system with neurons that picks out this little bit, this little bit, this little bit, this little bit, and it says there's an edge. Mm -hmm. It feeds it up to the next level mm -hmm. in the brain. And that part of the brain takes all of that and says, okay, we have a line. Mm -hmm. And then another part of the brain says, I think that line belongs to this area, mm. right? And that's the problem the robot has. The robot may see the line and say it belongs over here. And then it'll say there's a cup, you know, cup space way over here or something, and it'll screw it up. But our brain says there's a line and there's some object, and then it feeds it up. And the other part of the brain says, I think it's a cup. Mm -hmm. And then you can reach and you can grab it and you can pick it up. And so the question is, how does the brain do that so quickly? You could throw that cup at me with water in it, mm -hmm. and it could stay, the water could stay in the cup, and I could catch it, and I could drink it. You know, most robots at this point couldn't do something like that. And so the idea was that over time, over the 30, 36, 35 years, however old I am, I've had all this experience of dealing with the world and dealing with clear cups. And I figured out that that situation right there on that table is probably a clear cup and not a clear elephant or a clear cat or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and so the brain must be using memory from higher levels, feeding it back down to the visual cortex and telling the visual cortex what to expect. And increasing it, efficiency. Increasing, yeah, excitability, efficiency, expectation is one way to think of it. And so the brain is saying, there's more than likely a cup there and not a tiny clear elephant, right? And if you see a tiny clear elephant, you've got a problem probably, or you're on a psychedelic, right? <laughs> um, and so the brain is constantly priming the rest of the brain past, based on past experience. And that was really what I wanted to study. How does that happen? How early in the visual processing stream does that priming actually happen? And it, it turns even out- come ancestrally. Perhaps. Perhaps. I mean, yeah, maybe there's some older memory that's tuning the system, and that's likely. That's probably what genetics is doing to the brain. Um, and so we basically used a neuroimaging technique, a way to look at brain activation, to ask how quickly in time does memory feed back into the visual system? And we found very, very early. Whoa. Okay. Basically, the visual hierarchy is feeding back all the way to the earliest inputs of the visual system called V1 and V2, as, yeah. as we think. Yeah. And it's really priming the system at the earliest level, um, which just sort of went against some of the basic models about the way the visual system works. So, so our, well, we could say that our deepest, let's say, libraries of memory it has, a, has a feedback to the earliest parts of the information coming in through the visual system. Yeah. And so that, that, that feedback mechanism that, that's occurring increases efficiency. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Okay. Sure. Increases efficiency, updates the model as a way to think about it. The visual system is constantly creating a model. I mean, what I'm looking at right now in the world is a model of the visual input. I'm not actually looking at the visual world. Mm -hmm. um, and that model is based on past experience. Yeah. Um, and of course, you can tune that model in interesting ways um, yes. through psychedelics, Alex. brain stimulation, or yes. try not eating for 36 mm -hmm. hours mm -hmm. or 72 hours. That also will change the model, and you can have some pretty interesting experiences. So, you know, the model is constantly being updated based on incoming information and old information. And it's just constantly tuning this model based on, you know, the best, the best possible guess about what's out there in the world. But you know, that was one of the sort of take-home messages from my research and from my whole training is that what I'm looking at is just the best guess that my brain can give me. It's not really the actual data. It's an interpretation of the data based on past experience and based on input. And it's a very good guess, of course. I mean, it, it lines up pretty well. Yes, yes. And then there are ways to hack into that icon that we've turned th the cup into an icon and so if we want to get really in a space of awe about it we can do potentially things like a psychedelic or we can do something that resets us to that childlike state and so there's different ways to kind of tap into maybe some of the earlier ways that we were initially have had awe around a chair or a human or a building or a location around the world um, we have an image, the first image, your brain sees things you don't. Mm -hmm. You were just explaining this to mm -hmm. us. Yep. Okay, so walk us through this. Sure, so these are the stimuli we used in my experiment, and typically these are flashed for about 100 milliseconds, a tenth of a second, very fast on the screen, and they go off. And the typical percept, the perception that the subject has is of a black novel object. So we ask them, what do you see? They just say, novel. And we also show them things like a tree, you know, a black tree, a black basketball, and they'll say familiar. So it's novel, familiar, novel, familiar, yes, novel. Yes, yes. So here's a novel stimulus. But what we've done actually is we've embedded a familiar stimulus on the outside. Mm -hmm. So the border is actually a seahorse on both sides, and those seahorses are making the novel object in the middle. And the question was, does the brain also see a seahorse, even though the subject doesn't consciously see the seahorse? And there were two different theoretical ways. D different theories predicted different things, basically. One theory said the brain is going to assign the object. This is called border assignment in visual neuroscience. The brain says there's a border. And then it says the border belongs to the black object. And then you consciously see novel object. So that's a feed forward theory of vision. The feedback theory, the one that we believed in at the time, said the brain sees a border and it considers both situations. It considers maybe there's something out there that's familiar. And then another part of the brain says, no, 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 it's novel. And the other part says, I think it's a seahorse. And then and they start competing. There's a competitive process I, I in the had brain. that exact thing happen when I first looked yeah, at it. Yeah, right? And if you're tuned to it, maybe you can feel like, wait a minute, there's you, you know, something there's, going there's on here. There's an argument that happened. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, the idea is there's an argument happening in the visual cortex. And a part of the visual system says, I'm 80% sure there's a seahorse. And it's got all kinds of things going off, seahorse alarm bells. The other part says, I'm 99% sure it's novel. And the 99% wins, and that's what pops into your consciousness. And so it was really a demonstration that the brain is seeing objects that you're not. And that was what led. We got a lot of news publication out of this, and the news titles where your brain sees things that you don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is true, your brain is seeing a lot that you don't. In hundreds of... <laughs> in, in hundreds of milliseconds, yeah. this argument is happening. Yeah. And so, then we become consciously aware of what the final decision yeah. was. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. That was one of the fundamental things I was interested in, is you know, I was really interested in consciousness and how do we study it on a fine-grained scale it turns out that you can try to figure out the exact moment when someone is conscious of a stimulus yeah. that you flash for just a millisecond or five milliseconds or 10 milliseconds. It seems to be somewhere between 200 and 400 milliseconds. So if I flash this on a screen, it's a totally black room. You're conscious of something in your head, what you're thinking of, but then you have this flash of an object. How long does it take from the retinal impinging on the neurons firing all the way to your lateral geniculate nucleus into your visual cortex 
that takes about 50 to 100 milliseconds, probably not conscious then. But then you can see the information volley up the visual system, volley up into the memory system. And at some point along that line, it seems like consciousness emerges of that visual object. And where does the volley go from the visual system to what, where does it relate to the memory system? What area is that? Uh, it kind of goes from visual system, which is in the back, to uh, temporal cortex into the sort of memory system in the yeah. brain. And this is all highly interconnected yeah, yeah, system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the question is, when does consciousness emerge and where? And yeah. to those questions, we don't quite know <laughs> just yet. But it seems like if you're really measuring the neural timing uh, with electrical, um, electrical ways of recording brain activity seems to be somewhere around 200 to 400 milliseconds. And what we found, interestingly, is that the brain is still processing an object that you'll never consciously see after that point in time. Mm. And so the brain is still holding on to it. Mm -hmm. And the question is why? Why is the brain doing that? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think yeah. it's, it gets back to this notion that the brain it's giving you a guess. It doesn't really know what's out there. And, that, and like, as I said, this is a very, very difficult question for the brain. What's out there? What are all mm -hmm. these objects? Mm -hmm. And so the brain is going, I'm going to hold on to this just in case I'm wrong. If I get some more information that actually says, no, it's a seahorse, and you need to eat that seahorse if you're, mm -hmm. if you're uh, trying to eat, you know, at, if you're hungry and you're out searching for things, you may come back and scan again and say, OK, that's, that's something that I want. So both of the probabilities live, and then we collapse one of the two, and then that becomes the, the, what we're consciously aware of. But then somehow the memory system also retains the second one that we didn't actually collapse and make the decision mm -hmm. of. Wow, there's a lot of like, yeah, quantum mechanical <laughs> similarities. Yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's things aren't as definite when you look in the brain. I mean, we have this definite percept, and we feel like, this is reality, I'm looking at it, clearly this is a chair, I can feel it. But the brain is saying, it's probably a chair, you know? Yeah. Which, that's very similar to quantum mechanics in the sense that there's probabilistic wave um, fields and they collapse into an object, but really behind that, there's still a probabilistic field. And the brain is just dealing with probabilities all, all the time. All the time, 99.999% sure that's a chair. So I was making the point that what we are perceiving is a model, and it's a best fit model that the brain has given us. It's the best guess at what's out there. Um, if you go back into the philosophy of science and you ask questions like, can we know the truth, the actual truth, the stuff behind the stuff? You know, can we get at the person behind the curtain? If you think about what I'm saying here, it's, it's very similar to what Immanuel Kant argued, that what we are perceiving is interpretation of the sensory datum. He called it the, the noumena and the phenomena. The noumena is the data coming in. The phenomena is what we're looking at. It's a model being wrapped around the datum. And if that's the case, we're always going to be stuck in the interpretive model. Um, and Kant actually said space and time, causality, and I think 12 total categories are actually given by our brains or our minds to the datum. So space and time aren't actually out there. Space and time are in our heads. And they're added to the data because that's the only way we can understand the world. We have to have data spatially and temporally organized. Otherwise, this would just be a mess. And if that's the case, then what does that say about our models in science? They're models. They're just going to be good models. And we can get, keep getting closer and closer to the truth, but we're always stuck inside the model. And that's a crucial point. You know, when we're teaching our students in the lab now, we, we try to get that across. You, know, you don't have to pretend like we're going to know everything because we're scientists. You gotta, you gotta understand that this is a model, and it's, a, it's probably a better model than astrology, for example, if I can pick on astrology for a minute. You know, astronomy versus astrology. The astronomy model is a much better model of what's going on out there. Astrology is talking about other things, maybe, but if it tries to predict the movement of the stars and things, astronomy is a better model. It's just never gonna be the complete model of the cosmos. And so we have to sort of understand that because we're locked in these perceptual models. This would be a mess if it wasn't temporally and spatially <laughs> organized. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's it's quite, quite cool. Okay, and then also that uh, the mo we're limited to the model, and we're going to constantly be trying to update the models to get closer and closer to the source code mm -hmm. of the reality. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can get to some things of the source code, hopefully.
yeah. and and then also run our own simulated worlds. Yeah, and, yeah but I think that. that's also the power of science is that it's it's giving us an updated model that seems to be moving closer. Now, a philosopher is going to interject and say, wait a minute, isn't this circular, right? You're, you're using a model to understand the model and you're moving forward. But by, by testing the model with data and with feedback from a community of other scientists, there seems to be a way to move. Um, uh, do, maybe I can give Plato's cave as an yeah, analogy. Yeah. In, in Plato, he says that the situation that we're actually in is we're, we're tied to a cave. There are these people in this cave. They're tied to the cave. And they're looking at shadows. The sun is illuminating everything and creating shadows on the wall. The people in the cave think that's reality. It's all they know. They see shadows on the wall. But reality is that there's a cave, there's the world out there, and that the, the shadows are actually being caused by the sun. And so the nice thing about science is that it's, we're just creeping out of the cave very slowly by taking the empirical data and testing the model. And there's one, one, one girl over there in the corner who's saying, you know, you guys are looking at that shadow, but, or you're looking at reality, but if you, if you look at it from this angle, the whole thing changes. Mm -hmm. The math changes, or whatever she's doing, right? She's doing something to challenge that model. And I think that's really the power of science, is even though it may never be complete, it's somehow moving closer to getting us a little bit outside of the cave. And it may even one day say, there's the sun. Everything's actually being illuminating by this, this other source that nobody was looking at, quantum physics or something beyond quantum physics, mm -hmm. whatever it is. And then, so then how did then the idea come up that you wanted to do the postdoc with Army Research Labs, your nice labs um, as well, and, and um, the non-invasive cognitive enhancement lab. Mm -hmm. Okay, so walk us through the movement from doing all of this to that. Sure, so back in graduate school in Tucson, U of A, I started doing an experiment where we were recording from inside people's brains. So we're recording EEG, the electrical signal, from patients who are undergoing brain surgery. So I'm scrubbed up, I look like you know, an, a medical doctor, I've got the blue garb on, and they're putting electrodes down in the brain to try to help, uh, um, help Parkinson's patients sort of deal with that issue of the motor tremor. We know the parts of the brain to put an electrode, you turn that electrode on, the tremor goes away and they can open their hand up. And so we had this nice opportunity to actually go in. I literally, they had a hole in their brain, and a hole in their head, electrode in their brain, a wire coming out. I'm standing there at the operating table. The patient has to be awake because it's brain surgery. And there's a lead going into my EEG system, and I'm recording their brain. And so I started getting fascinated with this notion of brain stimulation because I saw how powerful that technology really can be. And you turn the stimulator on and their tremors go away. I mean, this person's life has changed. And really, that's why I signed up for, for science. I want, to, I want to understand consciousness and use that knowledge to change people's lives. That's, that's the goal. And so this was the first case where I was out of my visual perception lab and it's sort of in the operating room and seeing people's lives being changed. And I got sort of obsessed with brain stimulation at that point. Um, now, if you back up a little bit, uh, when I was back in a neuroscience lab, I had actually seen the Dalai Lama give a speech. And the Dalai Lama said, basically, if somebody, a brain scientist, can create a surgery or something like that to give him the effects of meditating without having to meditate, he would sign up. That was back when I was an undergraduate, I heard that. And so this little nugget, he implanted it in my head, you know, as a, as a student who was really, like, susceptible to having that happen. Um, and so here I was, I was seeing a brain surgery, I was seeing someone's life being changed, and at that time I was meditating myself and I was sort of seeing the changes that meditation can give you. And I started thinking, wait a minute, the Dalai Lama said brain surgery giving you the effects of meditation. And so I really started sort of thinking, is there a way to do this? Is there a way to do something like this brain surgery, but of course not with the brain surgery, that would modulate the brain? and give someone the effects of meditation. Or maybe if that isn't possible, help someone learn how to meditate quicker, which I think is a, a more realistic goal. Which so even I, the Dalai Lama endorses. Which the Dalai Lama endorsed uh, controversially. I think the people around him didn't want him to say things like that. 
But it really sort of woke me up to this possibility. What would that look like? And what would it look like for someone with Parkinson's to be able to be in control? Sure. And yeah, so there's so much potential with neurostimulation and you got fascinated being there with a, 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 literally a hole in the mm -hmm. cranium and then electrodes in and then you're mm -hmm. re-getting the EEG feedback yourself. That's yeah. what a cool moment as well to be uh, present yeah. there. At, yeah. yeah, patients yeah. would cry. I cried the first time I saw it. Sometimes the new nurses there would cry. I mean, you see it and it's like, this is changing someone's life. This is what we all signed up for. This is what we want to do. And here's a very clear um, situation where you're seeing that happen for someone. So, you know, it sort of changed me. It's, it sort of changed the direction that I wanted to go in. So I started looking for other ways to modulate the brain. Um, at that point, there were these other systems where you didn't have to drill a hole. You could put electrodes on the head. You could use very strong magnets. Um, so if you've got a magnetic field, you've got an electric field this way, right? Uh, going back to basic physics class. And so if you put a magnet and the, f the magnetic field is moving this way, you can induce an electric current in the brain. It can actually cause the brain to fire. So I kind of knew about these technologies. And I started wondering, can we use something like that to accelerate meditation and mindfulness? Um, and I started sort of moving down that path. That's when I met Stuart Hameroff. So I was actually doing one of these surgeries. It's called a deep brain stimulation surgery on an OCD patient. She had actually flown from a different country, took her very a lot of trouble to sort of get to the operating room, and she had OCD, which as you know is a very difficult disorder. You have to be awake during the surgery, and so it took eight hours just to get her down on the table, to get the hole in her head, and somebody in the operating room figured out that I have good bedside manners, and so they asked me to talk to her the whole time. And so I was going through this whole surgery and seeing how painful this was. You know, if this works for her, it was going to change her life. But this was a very painful process. Um, I was leaving the operating room and really, I think, searching for something else, thinking, OK, this is going to work for this person, but isn't there a better way to do this? Yeah. And I literally ran into Stuart Hameroff in the hall. Like, I bumped into him. Um, and he turned around and said, hey, what are you guys doing here? And I said, we're going to go have a beer. That was a really long surgery. And Stuart said, oh, you're doing deep brain stimulation. There's actually a better way. Yeah. And he sort of showed up with this answer, right? Yeah. The non-invasive brain stimulation. The non-invasive way. Um, and this way was actually using focused ultrasound, um, which mm -hmm. was a kind of new concept at the time. Um, so instead of using electrical or magnetic ways to stimulate the brain, which kind of makes sense because the language of the brain is uh, sort of electrical gradients, um, this is actually using mechanical energy. And using that mechanical energy, focusing it into the brain and actually trying to stimulate the brain. And let's pull up that second asset that we have and we can start unpacking this with visuals as well. Okay. so. Yep. Taking an ultrasound transducer mm -hmm. and targeting stimulation into specific areas. How the hell do you do this? So the trouble with electricity and magnetism is that it's hard to target it specifically and deeply. So with electricity, it just spreads everywhere, path of least resistance. With magnetism, it's hard to get it deep without causing a seizure. Um, and you don't want to cause seizures in your subjects and your patients. The nice thing about ultrasound is that you can actually focus the beam through the skull, and if you can do that properly, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hype this too much, it's a very hard problem to get the ultrasound through the skull. But if you can solve that problem, you can actually focus the beam anywhere in the brain, um, theoretically. And in a couple studies, um, they've actually focused it down to the thalamus, which is one of the wow. deepest spots in the brain. Yeah. So I think on the next slide, we might have a picture of actually focusing it through the skull. So this is um, another lab. This is not my lab. This is Wen Ligon's lab at University of Minnesota. And we're looking at the top of the head. So imagine you slice my head, mm -hmm. and now you're looking down into my brain. Um, the focused ultrasound is coming through the side of the head and focusing it into the thalamus. And you can see how focal that beam is. Yeah. So the red part is where we think the modulation is going to actually okay. happen. And now, you can target in a 3D space yep. with ultrasound because it somehow goes into like a co conical exactly. shape. Yeah, it's kind of like an egg shape coming from a single transducer. 
Now, uh, what a lab recently did, a different study actually showed that you can wake a patient up from a coma by stimulating their thalamus. So this is a person who has, I think, a traumatic brain injury. They've gone into a coma. They put this person in the MRI. They find the thalamus um, by targeting different parts of the brain. And then they stimulate it in a way that gets the thalamus back to its normal rhythm. Now, the thalamocortical rhythm is thought to be very fundamental to consciousness expressing throughout the brain, if you want to think about it like that. And so if you can get that rhythm going, you should be able to get consciousness to kind of jumpstart. And that's exactly what they seem to have done in this patient. It's one patient, and they have to replicate it. But if that's true, that really shows the power of something like this. You can get deep. You can do things like wake people from a coma, which is something like you see in the movies, right? Yeah. And it's a relatively simple technique. I mean, you have to have an MRI to do it at this point, so it's expensive. Uh, but getting the ultrasound through the skull and focusing is a pretty simple technique, actually. Okay, great. So this was the big aha moment for you, which was enough of this uh, drilling holes through brains. Let's right. figure out how to do this without that. And then waking people through comas. There's so much targeted stimulation. So where else were you hoping to get targeting, and what were you actually um, doing with the Army Research Labs and NICE Labs? Where were you actually targeting? What were you actually yeah, mm -hmm. helping solve? So in the beginning, what we did is we targeted through the temporal window. So this piece of the skull on the side of the head is the thinnest spot. They're here, and there's another spot in the back. So like I said, it's hard to get ultrasound through the skull. And so we decided to try to target parts of the brain that we think we can get ultrasound to. And in the beginning, we did a bunch of pilot tests. And we stimulated different parts of the brain. Um, we had people consent into this pilot. And it turns out that basically stimulating the right prefrontal cortex made people feel better. Mm -hmm. We actually enhanced mood. And so we thought, OK, this is pretty cool. We have a mood enhancer. We can use that for treatment for mood disorders, depression, anxiety, things like that. So the first 200 subjects, we ran through several studies. And we basically showed that by stimulating right through the temporal lobe, uh, so, sorry, the temporal window, we can hit the right inferior frontal gyrus. And we can basically make people feel better. Then we did that on a group of depressed patients. We reduced depression over the first day, but with a five-day protocol, we actually reduced anxiety over five days. And so it seems to be like a treatment that we can use. OK, a um, couple, couple questions. So we got new slides. We have new <laughs> slides, yes. So a couple questions. One of the questions is that there's a, a, a question about, is this through Hertz? Is this, is this a frequency? Mm -hmm. is this how, what, what is the frequency? What is the amount of power mm -hmm. behind this? That's, that's a crucial question if you're asking about safety. Now, the thing about ultrasound is that high intensities can destroy tissue. You can heat the tissue up, or you can cavitate. You can create bubbles. The bubbles will move, and the bubbles will burst, and that causes a sonic wave. And that's actually used to treat things like kidney stones. Um, so that's been well mapped. Of course, you can use ultrasound for imaging as well. So fetal imaging, brain imaging, they actually use ultrasound to image the brain in the hospital for stroke. And so what's nice about this field is the whole energy spectrum has been relatively well mapped, not 100%, of course. But we know uh, below a certain wattage, so below about 720 milliwatts per centimeter square, it's safe to use on the body, on the fetus, on the fetus brain, on the fetus body, all the wow. way up to the human brain and the adult brain and the adult body. If you go above 720 milliwatts, uh, up to a couple watts, there's a gray region. We don't really know how safe that is. It's probably safe, and as far as I can tell, it's safe. But we don't have a lot of empirical data, so we don't do that. If you go above many watts, you start heating up the brain or cavitating the brain. So we definitely want to avoid that. And anybody out there who reads about my research or hears about it who wants to create a device, they have to understand this. You know, this is kind of a fear that I have, actually, is I'll tell people, you can use ultrasound to enhance your meditation. They try to build an ultrasound device. And instead of 0.1 watt or 0.1 watt, point, point or 0.05 watts, they use 10 watts or 100 watts. That would hurt a person quickly. Quickly. could kill someone, actually. Yeah. So you know, the, there's a danger range here that is a little bit different than using electricity and magnetism. And that's why we have to do this in the lab. We have to do it with scientific controls and medical controls. We have a hospital that's in walking distance to my lab. I collaborate directly with medical doctors. Everything has to be very controlled. 
and it, like you said, within 100 to 700, let's say, milliwatts and yeah. not, <laughs> not 10 watts. Right. Yeah, this is a, this is, especially with the biohacker movement, lots of people are neurohacking. They're really trying to get into how to hack themselves. And so this is a warning. Yeah. You know, public service announcement. Don't do it. Yeah. And make sure that if you are, that you're being extremely vigilant with, yeah, with it. Right. Yeah, yeah, okay. Doesn't matter. <laughs> evil always wins, and that's the bottom line. <laughs> yeah, I'd say evil wins in the short term, and the good wins in the long term. Yeah, this planet is littered with lost civilizations, Doc. <laughs> Thanks for being you. So then, okay, so then what then, um, that was power, and then what about, so powers in milliwatts, what about then a frequency? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's power, there's duty cycle, there's the fundamental frequency, so the ultrasound frequency, and then there's how often you pulse that. And actually for safety, all of these interact. And so it's not just power. It, you could actually potentially do damage at the FDA limit if you did it continuously for 10 hours. And so it's not just the wattage, it's how often you pulse it, how often you're doing it to that brain, how much of a break you give to the brain. Um, and so what we do on the human skull, going through the skull, is usually about half a megahertz. Megahertz is a million oscillations a second. And that seems to be the sweet spot for getting ultrasound through, but doing it as safely as we can. 500,000 oscillations a right. second. So 500 kilohertz or half a megahertz. Kilohertz or 500 half a megahertz. 500,000 oscillations a second. Yeah, it's a lot. Damn, that's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. Okay. All right, so all of these things come together to the safety. Okay, critical and also just just barely starting to get into the weeds of the science. It's such a, yeah, and the technicals. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting stuff. Okay, what do we have here? Um, this is from another lab. Um, this is from Kim's lab in South Korea. What they're doing is they're trying to focus the ultrasound down to the visual cortex. Now, I, of course, I like this because this is a visual stimulation study. And the idea is if you can cause visual cortex activity, you could actually cause someone to see something that's not there. So a little hallucination. That's called a phosphine. And you can actually get a phosphine if you just press on your eyeball. Uh -huh. Don't press too hard, but yeah. if you press, then you see the little, yeah. little lights, little flurries are kind of fun. That's a phosphine. So you're getting that because you're actually causing the retinal cells to fire. You're actually pushing on those cells and you're causing some firing. So you can also do that by pushing on the visual cortex directly. Um, if I drilled a hole in your head and I pushed on it with some electricity, then I would get you to see things that aren't there. So they're doing that with ultrasound. You can see the little transducer. This is actually being done in the MRI, which is pretty neat. And what you see on the screen is actually the ultrasound causing visual activation. And for, I think, about 70% of the subjects, although it's been a while since I've read this, 70% of them got the stimulation and they actually saw little visual flurries. So little visual phosphemes that weren't actually there. And that shows it's focal and you can actually cause brain activation, which is pretty neat. And the, um, does it, requ it requires a, um, a, 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 a substance that uh, acts as a conducive as well? or? Yeah, in the scanner, you usually use water. Ultrasound use, passes right through water. You can use water. Mm -hmm. So there's a big water bag, yeah. and you lay your head back in the oh. water bag, and the transducer is behind the bag. Oh, okay. So that's the best way to do it in the scanner. There's some heating things you have to worry about in the scanner, so water is the best for that. In the lab, uh, we usually use ultrasound gel. So you just use the same gel they use for fetal imaging. Um, yep. You can use that. Interestingly, there's a paper out of the UK, I think, that showed that KY jelly works better than ultrasound gel for ultrasound kind of transmission, yeah. uh, just for various uh, you know, physics reasons. Yeah. Um, and also KY jelly is cheaper than ultrasound gel. So. Oh. But hmm. We don't usually keep that in the lab because it looks weird. Yeah, it all depends on what lab it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and the mar market, the, the, the stock price of KY went up after <laughs> that, that, that segment. Yeah, we can get them to sponsor us. That episode, this episode is sponsored by KY Jelly. <laughs> uh, Lube. So what did, they, what did you see when you did the, um, when they were doing this, this, 
uh, visual cortex stimulation here. Uh, what did the lab see? Yeah, what was happening when it was successful, the stimulation, ultrasound um, stimulation here? So basically it caused the subjects to see that visual percept, but what was really neat is how oh, vocal. When, without, oh yeah, without pressing or yeah. just in. So the person uh, just sitting in the scanner, the ultrasound is shooting into their visual cortex, and they're just looking at a blank screen, I think, um, or just looking into the scanner. And every once in a while, they'd get a pulse, and they would just see a flash. Okay. Pulse, they'd see a flash. And there was and nothing flashed for them. Yeah. Nothing actually in front of them. Yeah, yeah. And they were reporting actually where it is, because the visual cortex has a retinotopic map. So there's a, a map here. I can split it like this, right? So this quadrant actually has a spot. This quadrant has a spot. And then you can just map the whole thing. And so if you actually move the ultrasound around, I can actually move the little hallucination around your visual scene and make it dance. Yeah. And ultimately, what my lab is actually working on is trying to actually, um, you have to be careful about the way you say this because it sounds scary if you say it wrong, but you could create a holographic ultrasound image in the skull. So you could create like a ball or a square, for example. You could hit that into the visual cortex with ultrasound beam and then I would see a little ball. Correct. Right, and then I could see a little ball over here. So basically this is already happening right now, potentially. We're working on it, yeah. yeah, yeah. We, we want to yeah. demonstrate that, well, it would be pretty neat. <laughs> yeah, yeah to, yeah, to do ultrasound stimulation, be able to see yeah, things that are not actually physically there, but are stimulated in. Mm -hmm. This could already be happening, what you're describing of being able to stimulate things into the physical world could already be what we are, in fact experiencing yeah. right now right yeah so, so easy to hypothesize easy right? to hypothesize <laughs> if, if you're already talking about it like this yeah. okay all right and then the next slide as well with this all right so uh, this is a model that we've created in our lab so it's kind of hard to see on the screen but there's a brain there's some brain tissue underneath and this is a, an actual person's skull and as I was describing the real trick is trying to get the ultrasound through the skull as a focus beam the skull has different sort of thickness around different parts of it. It has little deviations and aberrations. And as you push the ultrasound beam through the skull, it bends it, it reflects it, it absorbs it, does all kinds of things that are not good for trying to get it through the skull. And so part of what our lab is doing is trying to find novel ways to focus that beam and do what's called aberration correction, correct the beam as okay. it's going through. And if How we can do, do that, that? Um, the best way would actually create this crazy sci-fi helmet where you had tens of thousands of little ultrasound elements and all of them are shooting down into the brain at once. That's the best way to do it. Um, ultrasound, 10,000 little ultrasound? Yeah, I'd, I'd put a million if I could. A million of them. If, and then, if there's a billionaire you, watching who wants to give me a lot of money, then I'll make this device, yeah. <laughs> and then you can uh, like hyper-target with a right. million ultrasound uh, rather than just one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then, interesting. But that would also, it would still have to go from the, the, the skull in. So you, I mean, it would still be partially stimulating all of the regions on the way in, right? So it still partially stimulates on the way in, does it? Right? It depends yeah. on how much energy each, say, say the, the non-target regions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the ultrasound's going through all of that, but if you had enough tiny elements, each one of those could emit, you know, say 50 milliwatts. Everybody's sending 50 milliwatts, which shouldn't affect the brain all that much, as far as we can tell. So 50 milliwatts is coming down, and then it sums to 700 milliwatts. Got it. Okay. That would kind of be the idea. Got it. Okay. And then the non-target areas aren't even being, yeah, as they're, stimulated. They're getting a little energy, a little jiggle, but then they just say, okay, okay. fine, going back to normal. Okay, cool, cool. All the right. other neat thing about that is you need to be able to image at the same time. So the brain is moving. If you just slosh around, your brain moves around a little bit. Mm -hmm. Every heartbeat actually moves the brain. So mm -hmm. you need a real-time measure of where the brain is and where the sensor is, the electrode or the ultrasound transducer, in real time. Now, of course, ultrasound can image. We know all about that because you do fetal imaging. And so you could actually image with ultrasound you could actually look at brain activation with ultrasound, looking at the bold or the blood activation, and you could stimulate all at the same time. So this is my like Ferrari, you know, dream car of, of brain stimulation helmet. I mean, this is really where you could go. 
And actually, um, a couple labs in France have shown recently that in animals, if, if you take the skull off, um, which they do in animal labs, um, which makes me feel bad for the animals, but take the skull off, you can actually get real-time fine-grain images of the brain, beautiful images. Um, if people look them up, they'll see them. Actually, better resolution than an fMRI. So the structure, you can see all this beautiful structure. And then if the animal is doing a task, you can see the brain activation with ultrasound. So that's my dream. Have that for humans, um, but leave the skull on. Yeah, non-invasively. <laughs> right. Okay, so you can get real, so you're, so you're trying to get, you're trying to get the neural activity real time being mapped as you do a uh, neuromodulation. Yeah. And then constantly be able to see what's happening moment to moment. Right. And that <coughs> would allow us to solve this problem, the aberration correction problem, because okay. then we'd be able to see wh what we're doing while we're doing it, and then we can correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And let's go to that next image, Ron. Okay. And what was the scale, the decibel scale, and what's this scale? Same scale? Uh, oh, this is missing. So this is a wattage scale. So this is a total scale. watts. The other one was decibels. Yeah. You, can, you can look at the total amount of sound energy you're putting in in decibels, or you can convert that to wattage. Oh, got it. So there's okay. different ways to look at the okay. energy. And is this in watts and not milli watts? This is an overall watt. So there's okay. a little subtlety here. Okay. Um, there's two ways to measure wattage. Uh, really, there's more ways to measure it in the brain. You can measure it over space, you can measure it over time, or over space and time. Whoa. Um, and like I said, we think in space-time, so we need to really think about both dimensions. And really, if you think about it over space, I could just ask, how much total wattage is there here? But if that's all I reported as a scientist, it would be a little bit of trickery, because really I want to know how much wattage is that neuron right there getting? Right, because you really want to be careful about the overall neuro overall wattage for very small spaces, um, and then you could ask how much is it getting over time, which is another question. So the overall wattage that the FDA limits to the body and the brain is in um, actually over a hundred watts total. Mm. But you could say that's a hundred watts over ten years, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, how how much mm -hmm. time, right? Yeah. So if you take the time into account, the FDA says per centimeter square of tissue or bone or brain, uh, over time, you're limited to 720 milliwatts. Um, so I could per, put another scale. For how long? Uh, so that, that's also, that's taking time into account. So time goes into the equation automatically. Um, okay. Over, oh, so 720 milliwatts per cubic centimeter, yeah. centimeter of tissue yeah. over, uh, per sec. Per total stimulation per time. Per total stimulation yeah. time. So that, okay. that's one thing that they haven't regulated yet, which they will at some point, is how much, so I could burst within a microsecond, you know, a, a tenth of a, a millisecond to a millionth of a millisecond. Um, and in that burst, I could deliver all 720 milliwatts. Now, does the brain, does that damage the brain? We don't actually know. And so that's what I was saying. There are these subtleties in the science that we haven't mapped yet. And someone who doesn't understand the subtleties may say, oh, I can do all 720 milliwatts within one microsecond. And then they get vascular damage or micro hemorrhages in their brain, right? I mean, stu stuff like that could happen. Yes, yes. Okay. So <clears throat> right now we follow protocols that come out of the animal literature okay. that we know are safe because they cut up the brains of the animal and they look at it from different dimensions. Okay. And then here's some of the data, the figures of data. Mm -hmm. Yes, teach us about this. Uh, if you go back to the other slide real quick. Okay. So one question we started asking is, can we modulate parts of the brain that are really um, starting to show up from the mindfulness literature? Really, what we're interested in now is accelerating mindfulness practice. And so here, uh, looking from the top down, we're ultrasounding into the anterior cingulate cortex. Mm -hmm. It's a very important part of the brain for error monitoring. So if I gave you a task and I said, every time I use the word the, put your hand up. And every once in a while I'd say three, and you put your hand up, that's an error. That mm. part of the brain would send a signal to other parts of the brain to make the brain ready for the error. Uh, in the and future. So the motor uh -huh. system has to get ready. The social system has to say, oh, I'm so stupid. You know, now I got to act smarter. You know, there's all these systems that deal with the error. Uh -huh. So that seems to be emerging from the interior cingulate. 
Okay. Now that's really important for mindfulness because what's happening in mindfulness is say you're supposed to focus on the breath. Your object is the breath. Feel the breath out of your nose. Doing it over and over. Every once in a while I'm going to start thinking about something else. That's essentially an error. Mm. And now you have to go up, bring the attention back to the breath. Yes. Bring the attention back. So that's a really important part of mindfulness. We think that the ACC, the anterior cingulate, is involved in that process. And so the idea was, if we put a little ultrasound energy into the ACC, can we make someone more mindful? Or can they learn mindfulness faster? Excellent. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah, so that, uh, this is a similar thing with the, when the font comes on the screen and it says the word red, but it's written in blue. Yes. Stuff like that. Right. And then your brain's like, ah, okay, now I know to not make that mistake. And then the social, like you said, as... And same thing with meditation when you're following your breath and then everyone experiences this when they meditate. The, the, you go to your calendar or your email or your yeah, social life. And, and then, so the, 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 the ACC seems to play a, a pretty uh, serious role in the body's ability to r reclaim the attention and bring it back? At least monitor. At least monitor. It's the monitoring monitor. piece. And okay. then the signaling piece, and then if you make another mistake, you know, it's that sort of monitoring within monitoring that's going on. Okay. It's involved in a lot of other things as well. Just yeah. sort of cognitive control or regulation in general. The list is crazy. Yeah. 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 Of what, there's an abundance of spindle cells, which is a, like a different shape neuron than normal mm -hmm. there's like uh, there's crazy stuff there yeah um but let's yeah let's stick on 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 the uh effect on neuromodulation with the the acc and then how that affects um uh mindfulness mm -hmm. yeah sure so basically we brought subjects into the lab this location was a control site for our mood studies because we were claiming stimulating here made people feel better, but what if it's just stimulating anywhere in the brain? Maybe the default mode is stimulate with ultrasound, you feel better. So we targeted at the top of the head, and that was going right down into the anterior cingulate, and we claimed that that shouldn't do much to mood in the way that the right stimulation was doing. So uh, in the end of the study, well, pre and post, before and after the study, we gave a mindfulness scale which is just a scale that asks, you know, how much are you paying attention currently? How much are you thinking about the past? How much are you thinking about the future? It's not a great scale, but it tries to get at this notion of current attention in the moment. Yeah. Um, so we just gave this to people. These people are not meditators. None of them have meditation experience. They weren't meditating during the study. They were just sitting there doing nothing. And we just gave them the scale just to see what would happen. And the idea was maybe stimulating the ACC would give them some attentional control so they would be more mindful, more in the moment, more likely to engage currently with what was going on instead of sort of talking to themselves and that kind of stuff. And then, so then the, the, this, the, so the neuromodulation that you performed with ultrasound was to the ECC uh, for how many uh, milliwatts over how long, how many sessions? Um, they got 30 seconds. So we, 30 seconds. what we're trying to do is the smallest dose possible to get an effect. Effect, okay. Uh, it's called the Alara principle in medicine. Um, you just use as little possible to get the effect. Effect, yeah. Correct. So 30 seconds seemed like way too little for us, but we were actually getting it there. So we tried 30 seconds. Um, for how many people? In that study, there was over 30, like 35 or 35. something like that. And then the next asset is what you had as, yeah, okay, yep. cool. So this is the data from the mindfulness scale. And essentially moving up the scale means you're more mindful. Your attention is more in the moment. Um, on the left, it's the pre versus post for people who got ultrasound. Mm -hmm. So basically in the orange bar there, people who got real ultrasound to the ACC reported more mindfulness on the scale. We also did placebo, of course. In the placebo condition, they moved down slightly. It's not a significant difference. but uh, really, there was no difference in mindfulness, which is what you'd expect. And so it seems like just stimulating that region alone led to people having more reported mindfulness in the current moment. So pretty neat, actually. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then so there, there, this is just the beginning of being able to apply a neuromodulation for enhanced yeah, mindfulness. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. this was a tiny little hint. I mean, we, we didn't really make much of this. Um, 
this was just a hint that maybe we can modulate those brain regions that sh show up in the mindfulness literature and actually help people learn mindfulness quicker. And you have a, an illustration here, the next asset that kind of breaks down mindfulness a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so in the lab, uh, we're always doing what we call operationalizing things. That means you need to define it in a way where you can empirically study it. Um, and mindfulness is notoriously hard to define. What is mindfulness? What is meditation? What are these higher states? You know, what is enlightenment? I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think we'll ever have a definition for something like that if it's real. But even coming down to mindfulness and just defining it so we can measure it is very difficult. So I've been working uh, with a meditation teacher, Shinzen Young, mm -hmm. um, very well-known mindfulness teacher, uh, a brilliant person, someone who really does have a beautiful mind. Every time you, you're hanging with him, you just learn something new and he blows your mind. Um, Shenzhen has a very scientific and objective reductionist way of sort of thinking about mindfulness. So he's a great person for someone like me to team up with because you know, he's already thought about how do you operationalize mindfulness, mm -hmm. how do you define it, and how would you study it. And so Shenzhen and I have been working together um, for almost two years now, I think, mm -hmm. on trying to figure out how do you define mindfulness, how do you measure it, and how do you modulate the brain to help people learn mindfulness faster. That's really what we've been talking about. And really, uh, to be honest, Shenzhen's the reason I've gone down this path. I mean, he's Love really it. sort of changed my life. 50 years in that sense. of experience. Yeah. Yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. But you only have to spend a couple minutes with him to, to have your life changed by him. So that's how brilliant and, that, and, yeah. and sort of uh, convincing he is. Um, and S so Sensory clarity, concentration, power, equanimity. Yeah, so Shenzhen has broken mindfulness down into three core attention skills. And he really talks about it in terms of acquiring these skills. Um, equanimity basically means having a balanced mind. So being able to allow sensations, thoughts, and emotions to arise and fall, rise and fall, without sort of resisting them, without getting attached to them, without sort of holding on to them. Um, so if you've ever had an, an emotional moment where you need to let go because you need to have an interview with someone and you gotta stop thinking about it, the more equanimity you have, the more you can just let it go and pay attention. So that's a skill. Uh, sensory clarity and concentration power are skills of concentration. So sensory clarity is being able to track visually, auditorily, sensorily, sort of what's happening. As a vision scientist, I really like this one because I can measure that. I can give you a bunch of visual stimuli really fast on the screen, and I can ask, how much do you see? Yeah. And someone who meditates a lot, so Shenzhen, for example, if you give him a visual paradigm, he can track all these visual stimuli really fast. Um, and so that's a trainable skill. Damn, versus actually having maybe like a little bit more of like a clouded yeah, yeah, right. view of Not that. even knowing that, you know, I can show you two stimuli really fast and you may have just seen them together as one. Whereas someone who's trained their attention would say, oh, it's a bird and a plane. Mm -hmm. It's not a bird plane, mm -hmm. like you saw. Um, concentration power is just being able to focus on what you're trying to focus on. So that's a really important one for the modern world because our attention's being split across everything. Everything. You know, Facebook and Twitter and our phone and vibration, you know, the phone is going off. And yeah. so our attention's really being split and we're, perhaps, uh, nobody knows yet, but we might be actually losing our ability to focus Agreed. on what we're trying to focus on. Agreed. And we find, uh, in many ways, the most meaning in our lives from sustained periods of focus yeah. on things that are our North Star. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I mean, one of the central claims of some forms of Buddhism is that actually having concentration power leads to insight. Insight about the nature of the self, the nature of the way things work, you know, these deep insights that like kind of change the way you see the whole world. Um, so that's called insight meditation. Um, and the idea is that you get things like insight when all of these things are working together. So Shenzhen's claim really is E any one of those is a good skill to have. If you're a basketball player, for example, Steph Curry's probably got all, all of these, really. But, you know, if Steph Curry really focused on concentration power, he's going to make more free throws, right? So there's sort of practice level practical effects from these things. But the claim from Shenzhen is that as these things are working together, that's what mindful awareness is. Mm -hmm. Having them all together in unison gives you the ability to get out of your way, to get out of your own emotional turmoil or whatever's going on, yeah. and just pay attention to the present moment. And then as you do that over and over throughout your life, 
what tends to happen is you become happier. You know, you start finding more meaning out of everyday life. You start tasting your food, hearing your music, enjoying hanging out with the people that, you know, previously were sort of making you upset or annoying you or whatever. So really, it, it's sort of just by using these skills, your general sense of well-being begins to change. And that's really the good stuff, as Shenzhen talks about it. Yeah, the mindful awareness combination of these three things can just radically change our lives, our family, community, civilizations, lives. So to be able to do something like a neuromodulation to hack the process is at the top of the list because then we can potentially update the code of our world in a more, uh, in a way that drives us closer towards that prosperity. Right. And that's kind of where we're, you know, where we're heading with the new um, SEMA, <coughs> sonification, sonication enhanced mindful awareness right okay and um the image on the way there this is an image of the default mode network the next one ronnie right is that what this one is that's right okay so part of the question is if if shenzhen is right or at least in the right direction of what mindfulness is can we stimulate different parts of the brain and help people have a little more equanimity or stimulate a part of the visual system and give you more concentration power so that when you try to learn mindfulness, you can sort of do that faster. You can learn the practice faster. You can see what is it like for me to actually have equanimity. Yeah. And now that I have equanimity, what's it like to try to concentrate on something? Oh, wow. Holy cow. Now I'm not getting distracted by thinking about, you know, Donald Trump messing up the world. Oh, my gosh. You know, that's OK. Let that go for a minute. Bring my attention back. You know, once, once people sort of feel that, you know, in their experience, then they can get motivated to do it more or they can actually learn, you know, how to do that quicker. And so the question is, if that's possible, what are the brain regions that we target? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where things like the default mode come in. So on the left, um, this is a picture of what happens when you put someone in an MRI and you just don't give them a task. So you just set them in there, they're maybe waiting for the task or whatever. If you look at what's going on in their brain, you typically see the same pattern in different subjects. That's called the default mode pattern. And it was called that because it was thought that's the default mode. The person is usually closing their eyes or laying in the scanner, it's very loud. And when they're in there, they're in their head, they're thinking about something, right? Usually, what am I going to do after this? I got homework. I said that stupid thing to my girlfriend. Oh my gosh, I'm sort of usually going that negative loop. So that's the default mode. Is the rumination. Rumination's part of it, but it's really about self-referential thinking. Self-referential thinking. So yes. selfing is, is sort of selfing. a term that you can that's talk okay. about. Yes. And selfing. selfing has a lot of dimensions, right? Yeah. It's planning, it's thinking, it's thinking negative, thinking positive. There's all these different dimensions to selfing. But this core pattern, so the posterior cingulate, the medial prefrontal cortex, and some parts of the parietal lobe. That shows up when most people are selfing. It doesn't matter what culture you're in, what your socioeconomic status is, uh, past experience, whatever it is, that shows up. And so some people are claiming this is the neurophysiological basis of the self. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably not true. I mean, there, we may never know what that mm -hmm. is. But at least it has something to do with thinking about the self referring to the self and that kind of stuff. So what happens is if you have a depressed person in the scanner, you'll see more red. More red means more activation. Mm -hmm. More and self referential thing. More selfing, right. And it's usually negative selfing. Mm -hmm. So in depression, you ruminate. You get stuck in negative thought loops. Mm -hmm. I'm so stupid. Why did I say that? Alan asked me this question, and I really should have explained it differently. Mm -hmm. That's a normal process, and that's a good process to have. But if I do that for the next five weeks yeah. while I'm giving a talk yeah. or while I'm with my girlfriend, that's a problem yeah. because then it's taking me out of what I need to be paying attention Correct. to. That happens in depression. And so you'll see way more red. In the blue here, this is long-term meditation. Mm. And blue means less activation relative to control people. Mm -hmm. And so the blue brain is the, the mindfulness brain is actually the opposite that you see to like the depressed brain, for example. That makes total sense because mindfulness is all about putting your attention into whatever's going on. If you start selfing, you pay attention to it, but then you don't engage with it, right? 
and then you bring your attention back to Alan, and then I bring my attention to the sound. Okay, when I sit down in a chair, and I don't have my laptop, I don't have TV, I don't have my phone, I don't have anything to distract me, but I just sit down in a chair, whether I'm outside or inside, wherever, if there's a lot of people walking, a lot of buses or whatever, versus if I'm just looking at some trees without anyone else there, or if I'm just in the studio space with no one else here. What is the difference between me having a mindful presence in the chair versus me having a selfing default mode network experience that's, in the that's chair? That's a great question. If you figured that out, you'd get a really good science paper. <laughs> but we have some clues. Okay. And the clues are, uh, so you can think about it as mind wondering versus mindfulness, if you want to put it on a spectrum. Okay. And there's ways to study and probe mind wondering. A mind wondering is just letting your mind do whatever it wants. Sometimes it'll pay attention to the sound. Sometimes it'll think about what to eat later. Sometimes it'll think about stupid stuff I said. It's just kind of balancing all around. Mindfulness is effortfully focusing on an object. That's one way to do it. So, but if then the mind wanders to a place, I can, that is not a place of excessive rumination like we were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. But if it wanders somewhere cool like, ah, I'm seeing the plant in a new way. Sure. If I, can I be mindful with that thought that came up? Mm -hmm. Is that the idea? So yeah, there's another mindfulness practice that's not effortfully focusing, it's effortfully paying attention to whatever the mind is doing. So it's almost like a, a third perspective, if you zoom out from it. Um, it's called metacognition in okay. psychology. Um, so that's called open awareness practice. You can do open awareness where if I just try to start paying attention to the whole room. It, it almost feels like my consciousness expands around the room. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's also mindfulness because you're paying attention to whatever's going on and you can let your mind wonder. It's, it's fine to do that. But by paying attention to what the mind is doing, it's less likely to get looped, it's stuck in those loops. Okay, so then there's a, <clears throat> basically there's, so the sides are, are mind wandering and mindfulness and mindfulness could be in a way a meta perspective on the mind wandering. Sure. Okay. It could do that. Whereas and doing mind it intentionally with potential towards uh, unity with this uh, or a development of an idea that one is having. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. And not the excessive rumination. So doing it intentionally. Yeah. The intention is really important. And the intention from a brain point of view gets into things like the interior cingulate. Because if you... Uh, you know, this is a, not the right way to talk about the brain, but if you tell the anterior cingulate, another part of the brain says, hey, start paying more attention. The ACC is going to get a little bit more resources and give you more ability to start tracking what's going on. Okay. And if the ACC is saying, well, tell me when the attention, uh, tell me when you lose the ability to pay attention to what's going on. So that's the open awareness piece. If you just start getting lost, uh, you start thinking about food, you think about where your food comes from, you think I want India, Indian food, you start thinking I should go to India because I need to learn how to meditate. Now you're getting lost. This is a Sharon Salzberg analogy that I really like. And Sharon actually went to India to learn mindfulness, to learn meditation, um, and then turned it into mindfulness in the West. And so you can get lost down that track. That's not mindfulness. Mindfulness would be paying attention, seeing that happen, and seeing it lead to the next thought, and then bringing your attention back to whatever's going on, and then hearing the birds, and then feeling the sensation, how oh, hearing the birds sounds nice, actually, and then saying, okay, come back, you know, and just continuously bringing yourself back. This is an award-winning science paper. This discussion is fascinating. Um, okay, uh, and more for in part two at some point to unpack more, di more depth into this. More yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. So, and then this is the most recent uh, endeavor. So this is now, uh, you're doing this at the Center for Consciousness Studies at the University of Arizona. Mm -hmm. right. Sonication Enhanced Mindfulness Aware. So this is kind of where we built up to. You are now going to be doing this with most of your time is conducting this research of ultrasound neuromodulation to areas like the anterior cingula to uh, uh, catalyze mindfulness right okay yep and what we did in the beginning is Shenzhen and I started talking um, about the feasibility of this what what would the science look like how would we know we have a good effect 
and uh, a little bit of worrying. I don't see Shenzhen worry much because he's such a mindful person. Um, but if he worries about one thing, it's about what if we do something bad? What if we disrupt sleep or disrupt someone's ability to make new memories? I mean, we are talking about the brain. We're talking about modulating something that we have very little knowledge about how it yes. actually works. And so we talked about all this for a year, and Shenzhen and I talk a lot about this. Um, and we decided, okay, this is worth doing because if it's real, we'll have clinical interventions for almost every disorder. Um, if you can reduce suffering at its cause, you should be able to reduce suffering in chronic pain, addiction, all the way down the list. You should be able to create an intervention for all of these things. And we thought that the risk was worth trying. Um, but we wanted to do it on people in the beginning who have a lot of experience exploring their consciousness, if you want to think about it like that. So people who know what altered states are like, and they have the skills to deal with being altered. Uh, people with a lot of mindfulness experience have that skill. And so we decided, all right, the first subjects will be very long-term meditators mm. who um, have enough experience and practice to be okay if we sort of push them in a weird direction for a couple minutes. They can bring themselves back. Turns out Shenzhen signed up for, to be the first study. The first subject, the first study was going to be Shenzhen. Um, he consented into the study and he was so overjoyed to be part of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, just being around Shenzhen at this point was, would make anybody happy. He was just so happy. Um, so we put Shenzhen through a two-week protocol and we started sonicating the default mode and other parts of the brain that we think should basically enhance equanimity. You're now <clears throat> not just sonicating from through the anterior cingulate, you're doing other areas. Yeah. Okay, which ones are you doing? So we did the head of the caudate nucleus, uh, which is part of the basal ganglia. Um, you, wow. That's a deep structure. That's a deep structure. It's an important yeah. structure for basic motor function all the way to learning and memory and sleep and other things. And so that's a, that's a high risk, actually, area. Um, but we did that because Shenzhen found this very, very fascinating disorder called athymhormia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've talked we, about that in a, a TED talk getting recently. Getting locked in the present moment. Yeah, right. Yeah. These people have bilateral lesions of their basal ganglia. Um, and what happens is if you get the right lesions at the right place, these people go into what seems like a pseudo-arhat if you're a Buddhist or if you're interested in philosophy, they're completely conscious without any content. Like imagine just being completely conscious of everything but no contents within that consciousness. Everything is just consciousness. God, that'd be interesting to right. be able to <laughs> tap into an, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So yeah. in Buddhism, pseudo-arhat means someone who's fully awakened, fully enlightened, wh however you want to define that, but they can turn it on and off. off of, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And in some traditions, you turn it off to become a bodhisattva, so you can come back and give, give love and, and, and the, the practice back to the people, yes. so which is what the Buddha did. Um, so Shenzhen looked at this and thought, aha, now we have a spot in the brain we can target that if we could safely target just for a couple minutes or a couple seconds, give someone a taste of that, whatever it is, uh, that would radically change someone's life. Or if not, it would at least help them zoom into a meditation practice. But the real goal is radically change someone. Get them out of their egoic turmoil um, long enough to see that this is a beautiful existence. We're all together. We're all one. And if we see that, maybe we'll work together to save the planet and do all the other things that we need to do. Um, so we went after the head of the Kade. We went after the default mode network. We went after a couple other structures in Shenzhen. And we gave this uh, one in a million, I think I gave it, Shenzhen was giving it one in 10,000, something like that. We just thought, this will be fun, Shenzhen and I will try this, and then we'll go home and laugh about it, and that's it. Um, the first experiment, Shenzhen basically said, I think I have more equanimity. We did it again three days later, he's like, there's more equanimity. We did it three days later again, he's like, this is working. Holy crap. A lot of explicatives came out. Mm -hmm. um, and and how said, many uh, milliwatts were you? Uh, at that point, it was 400 milliwatts. Okay. So I actually halved the legal limit um, yeah. just to make sure we were being safe. For 30 seconds. Uh, at this point, it was 
Um, I don't know the total, it was 60 pulses. So the pulses are very pulses. short, they're micro pulses. They're probably not even 30 seconds total. And on uh, four different re regions? Included? Just two. ACC and? Just, we did just the basal ganglia. Just the basal ganglia, wow. In the beginning, yep. Just because wow. I didn't want to do too much, you know, we just, we don't, we don't want to undo the networks in the brain over time, you know, sure, Shenzhen sure. has a relatively old brain, he's 73, I think, yeah, at this yeah, point. Yeah. Every three days you're doing this for? For an hour total, so it's 60 pulses over an hour. Over an hour, okay. The pulses are very short, we turn it off just to make sure everything's okay and turn it back on. Now Shenzhen's meditating the whole time. Yeah, whole time, yeah. So what he's doing is he's really introspecting. He's watching the watcher. You know, he's mm -hmm. watching what's going on. He's using different meditative practices, and we give him a little burst, a little jiggle. Um, by the second week, he was like, "I think we're on to something. You should think about doing this more often." And I thought, "Well, I'm not going to give up my whole career, you know, for this kind of crazy meditation person who shows up in my life and tells me to do this really sort of." interesting thing, but you know, okay, let's try the trial again. So we waited several months just to make sure everything was okay. I did cognitive testing on him. We had actually taken MRI on him a couple times. Everything seems fine. So then we did uh, a multi-week study over three weeks this time, spaced it out over three days. By the third week, Shenzhen started really deeply experiencing those insights that I was talking about. This was really doing something to him that was opening up the meditation practice. When the pieces came together, the equanimity, sensory, clarity, concentration, power. Right, which he already has a lot of. But, you know, meditation practitioners, uh, you know, we, we have our habitual patterns that get locked in. And by stimulating a different part of the brain, different parts of the brain for Shenzhen, it sort of opened up a new door or something for him. And now you're going to be doing this more with experienced meditators. Right. Okay. So with Shenzhen, we thought, okay, this is interesting, but I'm still not going to give up my whole life path. Um, Shenzhen's very biased. I'm very biased because I'm a meditator. We want this to work. And so we thought, okay, we can't even really tell anybody about this because it's just Shenzhen. So then we replicated this on five people in the lab. We came in, they did four days of the intervention. And there was a control? Uh, I did a placebo on them. So I knew they were getting placebo, but they didn't. So yeah. it's single blinded. Yeah. Um, when they got the real stimulation, almost all of them said way more equanimity. Now these are all students of Shenzhen's, mostly at least. Um, so they know the language, they know the lingo, but they're also biased again uh, by being students of Shenzhen. Um, and they all said, holy crap way more equanimity, like, like being on a retreat, like wow. you know, yeah. days and days, days of unplugging and focusing for hours a day, but this was Whoa. just one hour. One hour, yeah. And a couple of them were very skeptical. They were like, this is silly, you guys, yeah, the Shenzhen, yeah. this little pet project, and Jay, you know, doing mm -hmm. this and whatever, but mindfulness works, meditation works. Why do we need brain stimulation? Uh, we converted most of them at the end. They all said, okay, this is something that could potentially change the world. Keep doing it. Okay, great. And now this is going to be rolling out to hopefully more now trials for right. you at the uh, University of Arizona. Right. You're going to so, keep doing right. this. Right. We continued replicating on more people. Uh, kept getting a similar effect. It doesn't work in everyone. It's not, it's not going to just be a 100% yeah. effect. But we got enough there that we thought, we got to do this, you know, we got to do this full time because if, if this is real, this is going to apply to all the different disorders, clinical applications that we want to apply it to. And if that works, it's going to apply to everybody else as well. There's suffering throughout life for everybody, not just people who have depression or chronic pain. We all have that. And if we can give people the ability to learn mindfulness skills quicker, that's going to apply to that suffering and it's going to help reduce suffering globally, global yeah. scale. I mean, that's the way we're thinking. We're thinking across the globe. This is an intervention that could work. Yes. Yes. And there's still so much to understand about where to in induce neuromodulation <laughs> in order to um, amplify mindfulness. But yeah. That's such a cool. So, great, right. We have the subject. big, we have the big goal and we, we know what we want. Now we have to validate it. So now we're doing double-blinded studies. Um, I won't be the one doing the, the stimulation. I need to be removed at yes. this point, so I'll yeah. train people. Uh, we'll be doing it in the MRI scanner, because you can do them simultaneously. 
So that way we can see that we're targeting and activating what we think we're activating. Yes. And also look at the brain over time to make sure we're not increasing this node and decreasing another node. Yeah. Yeah. Because the brain is this hugely dynamic system. Yeah. And we need to make sure that we're not giving you equanimity power at the expense of language production, right? Sure, sure. Or learning or something you know, along those lines. Sure. And so we'll be looking at all of those different dimensions to make sure that this is a possibility. Excellent, yeah, the, that complex dynamic that you just said there, uh, uh, good luck measuring that. That's, right, yeah. that's yeah. very, very yeah. difficult. Yeah. I'm basically partnering with people who are smarter than me and further good. along their path. Yeah. And basically finding people who have already solved some of these problems, teaming up with them, convincing them this is a worthwhile goal, Yes. and then using their tools. Yes. And I think at this point, in science in general, it's got to be collaborative. When you're talking about something like this um, with, you know, Buddhist concepts turning into reductionist mindfulness and then talking about the brain. It's got to be a collaboration to do something like that. I would love to see this process blow up and have more and more uh, people that are going through this at the lab and, uh, and then leaving with transformative results. It sounds like a beautiful, beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But even as you say that, you know, thinking if you're transforming someone, you have to support that person. And there is so a supportive process. Part of, you know, part of what we hope for is transformation. Part of what we worry about is transformation, right? It's this sort of two-sided coin because so, yeah. we want to make sure that person transforms into a happier person, you yes. know, defining that broadly and deeply, not just a state of happiness, but happiness as a more meaningful life uh, really is what we're going after. Yeah, and and so this is, a, this is a long process. Everyone who comes through the lab, we're going to be following for years. That's the thing. Giving yeah. them support, making sure everything is OK. It's like a psychotherapist. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Right. So it's a long process. Yes, yes. And um, the, the Center for Consciousness Studies, mm -hmm. yeah, what is that? What are you guys doing there? So it is uh, a center at the University of Arizona that was founded back in the early 90s. Um, by Stuart Hameroff um, and a, a couple professors at the university, Al Kasniak and a couple others, to attempt to define the problem space for consciousness studies. Um, because before that point, um, you know, in the 80s, 70s, 60s, 50s, you couldn't even say the word consciousness in a lab. I mean, if you were alive in the 50s, B.F. Skinner was reigning, um, the behaviorist, you know, they were saying, consciousness isn't really real. Some of them were, I, I don't know exactly who B.F. Skinner was, but some of the behaviorists were. And they were claiming that cognition and consciousness, no point in studying it, just study behavior. Behavioral responses, conditioning, fear responses, that's all there is. All this other stuff is a delusion, it's a lie. Um, you know, the Buddhists also say that. This is all a delusion, it's a lie. Um, but, you know, from there, through the Chomsky revolution, through the cognitive revolution, it became okay to talk about cognition, memory perception, all these other things, and actually look for them in the brain um, as, as I got my PhD in. And so the Center for Consciousness Studies was right at the, the beginning of being able to talk about a science of consciousness. What does that look like? What are the dimensions of that? What's the science? What are, what's not the science? You know, how do you define the barriers and the boundaries? Um, they then hired David Chalmers, who was at the University of Arizona. He's a very famous philosopher who's basically uh, at the conference back in the early 90s defined the, what he called the hard problem, which is that you can study the neural correlates of consciousness, what's going on in the brain as I'm conscious all day, but it doesn't tell you how that creates consciousness. That bridge is the hard problem. Um, so that was kind of the center in the beginning. They spun out a consciousness conference, which is now the biggest consciousness conference in the world. Every other year it's in Tucson, and mm -hmm. then we do it international. Mm -hmm. So this year it's in Interlochen, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, and I just learned that I'll be going this year. Uh, Excellent. Someone's going to help me go, yes, which yes. is really cool. So Excellent. I'm very, very excited about that. Um, and the idea is basically open the doors to anybody who has something meaningful to say about consciousness studies. Now the trick is we don't have any idea about what's generating consciousness. I think it has something to do with the brain because I'm, I'm studying in brain science. Um, and I think things can be reduced until you find the bits that create consciousness and that emerges. But also I kind of feel like everything is conscious. 
I'm also sort of a panpsychist. Pan -psychist, yeah. Right? And there's this other bit of me, you know, the experiential bit of me through some experiences I've had that make me think like, you know, the Bhagavad Gita, the Hindus were right. Everything is imbued with consciousness. Mm -hmm. So I, I myself hold contradictory views. Yes, yes. And I have no way to test those as a scientist. And so the consciousness conference has been very open to letting everybody come together, biologists, chemists, physicists, all the way to uh, medical doctors and very well-known people like Deepak Chopra. And we just open the doors and we say, everyone come together, try to put your ego aside for a minute, try to put some of your bias aside for a minute and talk about this problem and let's see if that's fruitful. Um, and it seems to have been helpful. We haven't solved the problem of consciousness. Um, it's hard to know how much we've advanced the field, but it's at least given people now the, the modern parlance as a safe space, although I, that term is kind of funny to say, but it's given a safe space to talk about consciousness studies. Um, now, we've taken a pretty big hit recently from academics because we let in all kinds of weirdness, you know, weird people if you want to say it sometimes that way, the weird stuff weird is ide ideas on the right track sometimes right yeah. but Einstein's ideas were weird, weird in the too. beginning right yeah. Um, yeah. Copernicus yeah. and so we're open to weird ideas you know and, and letting that in and and trying to trust the rational discourse to decide what is right and really we're trying to create that context to make sure that it's moving in the rational discourse sense great great and um, the Center for Consciousness Studies uh, is uh, what month is that going to be in Switzerland? It's next month. Next in month Switzerland. in Switzerland. Okay, excellent. And then, um, and there's online materials for people to be able to check out too. Yeah, you can check it out. We just uh, posted for next year. We're having it back in Tucson. Um, I think it's in June again next year. In Tucson. Uh, we have it at this beautiful resort called Los Ventania Resort. Um, I don't make any money from them. I'm not. I'm not uh, giving a shout out to them because I'm biased. Uh, but it's this beautiful resort, uh, 400 rooms. We sell out the whole thing. There's about 500, 600 people who come. And what's the URL? Um, that's a good question. Let's search for Center for Consciousness we will. Study on we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that that URL is in the bio, everyone. Um, OK, quick question on the way out. Mm -hmm. Are we in a simulation? My intuition is yes. Uh, we're at least in a model. Um, and I can tell you that with high probability. I can't tell you for sure because I'm a scientist. But we are looking at a model. We're interacting with a model all the time. And if you want to call that a simulation, I think it is. Now, if the simulation has been created by something higher than us, I can't tell you. But uh, it would be cool if that was the case. And then what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? The most beautiful thing in the world? Um, I am a practicing mindfulness person, and I'm going to say the present moment. If you can bring your attention and your full consciousness in the present moment, that's where beauty is. Mm. This has been so wonderful, Jay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah. Thank you for teaching us about everything that you're up to. Yeah, this has been great. Thanks for having me. You're super, super welcome. And I would love for everyone to get chatting more about things like neuromodulation for enhanced mindfulness. Get talking to your friends, your families, your coworkers, people online on social media about what this is, what our future is like with these technologies. And give us your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Check out the links in the bio to Jay's work. Also, Check out the links in the bio to simulation. The entrepreneurs, the organizations, the artists around the world that you believe in, support them. Support us, help us continue scaling and impacting and growing. Huge shout out to Ron Vogus for producing and directing. Thank you very much. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you soon. Peace.